I'm joined here on the set by Microsoft Research Director Kristen Toll. Joining us, we had planned via Skype a very cool thing all the way from Kenya. We're work even the internet's got to sleep sometimes. Sure. It's like 11 o'clock over there. Uh, but I want to talk to you about what we're going to talk about, some really cool stuff. Um, one of your colleagues in the field in Kenya currently, she's working on an ambitious project to use computing to catalog and preserve our planet's wildlife. And it's quite fascinating. And the, and the easiest way that I was sort of explain sort of what's happening is that essentially things like zebras, the stripes on their backs are like fingerprints. They're actually that unique and that this technology is able to help track them identify them, catalog them, and all of that, right? Absolutely. In fact, if you think about the example this morning in Harry Shum's talk where they were had the dogs come out and they were saying what kind of dog they were. Yeah, right. With individual animals like zebras, they're like, well, barcodes. Essentially, you can use machine learning to not only identify what type of animal that they are, but get down to even individual uh, uh, animals and be able to mm -hmm. see how they interact with one another, be able to track their progress through life without having to put any kind of heavy sensor or thing right. like that. That actually might disrupt their migration patterns or something like that. So, um, yeah, that, that same technology that we were showing this morning mm -hmm. can be applied in the wild uh, for with using low-cost sensors, camera traps, even flyover video drones. Now, I'm going to ask you some about more about the Microsoft collaboration here, but uh, we were going to talk to Tanya about sort of this strong citizen science aspect to the project. Sure. Can you speak to that at all? Absolutely. So, um, we all take photos all of the time. Right. We're, we're camera happy. And one of the things that we know is that everybody has a camera phone, even in, mm -hmm. in Africa, mm -hmm. in these emerging nations. And the thing we want to be able to do is, you know, the the quality of those images isn't always necessarily the best, but but that's actually how we can track these these animals, how we can monitor where they go in the wild, how they interact with one another, is through these types of video images or even just simple uh, camera phones. Uh, and the way that we're doing it is we're taking machine learning to identify the individual animals in there, um, uh, but allowing people to really sort of participate in that process. Mm -hmm. if they're out in the wild, they're out on a hike, they want to take an image of a particular animal, they can take a shot of it and say, this endangered species is actually in this particular location. We can get the GPS location mm -hmm. read from the phone as well. Now, as I mentioned, we had a, a little bit of an internet issue here. Uh, we're going to talk with Tanya Berger-Wolf, Associate Professor, University of Illinois, Chicago. We actually did an interview with her earlier. We're going to take a look at that now. Great. Hi, Tanya. I'm so glad that you could be with us today. Can you tell us a little bit more about your computational ecology project? Yes. We're building an image-based ecological information system. This is a computational system that will allow us to go from images, which have become the most abundant source of data about the natural world, to scientific insights through the pipeline of image analysis, information integration, and queries, analytical queries to those data. We want to create a biodiversity view of the planet through the lenses of individual cameras. What outcomes were you expecting? To enable new science. Wow. <laughs> uh, the field ecology, field biology, is limited by the number of people that can collect data, the ability to put out sensors in of often inaccessible, inaccessible environments, uh, to capture the animals that have to be just at the right spot at the right time. Um, and then if we go to more automated image, uh, data collection sources, then the limit is the ability to analyze them. So by putting together the system where we can go from all this multitude of images to the data extracted from that, we're hoping to enable science at much higher resolution and bigger scale from individual to ecosystems, from seconds to lifetimes. Wow, that's great. What would you say are some of the really good outcomes that you've had, like the people that you've interacted with while you've been here? Besides the computational ecology group in Cambridge, uh, I've connected with people in computer vision here in Microsoft Research Redmond. There is all the wonderful work on visualization from Layerscape Worldwide Telescope that we're going to use fetch climate. We'll provide the data for the climate, for the areas, for the ecological context. The system will be built on Microsoft Azure on the cloud because it is, the information is coming from all these various sources, so it has to be sort of uh, aggregated on the cloud, but it also the people who are looking for, the, for that information and are using this information are distributed all over the world, so they have to access it, access it through the cloud. 
Oh, great. So I'm glad that Azure's played a role. Are there other technologies that you've encountered while you've been here that have actually played a role and helped you out in the project that you're doing? Photosynth and uh, Image Composite Editor are the perfect tools for us to take this multitude of photographs and create a picture of a population of an animal, of an encounter with a wildlife. So we're going to continue these collaborations and continue building um, and expanding these tools because uh, in their current capacity, they actually are not quite able to uh, take advantage of the data that we're going to be collecting within the context of building the system. Yeah, so it's been an exchange, basically. Yes. We've got to learn from you, and you've got to learn from us. It's been a wonderful exchange, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about the future. Where are you going to go from here with the project? So we're building the pilot of the pro project and deploying it in Kenya in July. Uh, it's exciting. We're going to see first time live in action uh, our ideas out in the field where the tourists are going to take pictures of animals. We're working with, an old, with the old Pejeta Nature Preserve and Impala Research Center in the Lake Kipe Conservation Area of Kenya. So we, we're going to go there and the tourists who are taking pictures are going to become deputy rangers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we will try out our system using those pictures to extract the information and actually get right away the feedback to the tourists and build the system for the scientists as well. And uh, hopefully a couple of years from now, with funding, uh, <laughs> we, we will have a system which is capable of extracting information from image data that comes from all these sources. Uh, from online albums down to the last little drone flying over some remote area in Namibia uh, or anywhere else, and create the biodiversity view of the planet from these lenses of individual cameras that are deployed all over the world. Yeah. It sounds like this is a great research project. Tell me a little bit about the citizen science aspects of it. We are particularly excited uh, about using tourists and just accidental photographers and incidental photographers <laughs> <laughs> um, as data providers, but also data labelers, um, as, when, because we need to annotate these images to train the algorithms to recognize species and individual animals. Um, because in this field, people are not only willing, they're excited to provide that information. They become engaged through giving this data, to, uh, through collecting the data, from learning what you can get from those data, and then become activists in uh, conservation and advocates for conservation in the world, because they know what's happening, they feel a part of it, they can follow uh, through social media, we're building extensions through social media about their zebra, the one that they saw when they were out there. And uh, it's also a great educational tool because uh, kids can get engaged by looking at the images, by seeing, uh, learning about the species, learning how to identify the species in those images. And that provides data again for the algorithms. But also, when you go to the zoo a year from now, then instead of this 19th century technology where you see the printed information about the species you're looking at, we will be able to maybe put a screen that will show, and the zebras that you're looking here, the zoo, here's what they're doing out in the wild. Here's where they have been over the last week. And that, to me, is incredibly exciting. Yeah, to engage with the public that way. Yes. Yeah, that's terrific. Tell us about some of your collaborators, some of the external collaborators that you're working with on this project. Oh, this project would not have happened without the wonderful collaborations of many people involved in this. But the main collaborators for the project specifically uh, are, well, University of Illinois Chicago is involved, of course. Um, Dan Rubinstein is the ecologist uh, from Princeton University. He's been studying zebras and other equids for many years, and so it's through him that we started working uh, many years ago, and this idea of the system came, uh, came up. And then uh, we're collaborating with a computer vision expert from Rensselaer Polytechnical mm -hmm. Institute, Chuck, uh, Chuck Stewart. And uh, recently have been joined by the uh, Wild Me nonprofit, 
that uh, tracks sharks. Started out by tracking encounters oh. with sharks and citizen science project. So Jason Holmberg from Wild Me is our main data architect and uh, building this sort of database foundation for the project. And it's happening in Kenya at the Impala Research Center and the Old Pejeta Nature Conservancy. So with all those people involved, talk about some of the challenges. I mean, obviously with that many folks going, uh, working with you on the project, that's gotta present a challenge. What are some of the others as well? Every bit of it is challenging from collecting data in uninstrumented, power constrained and bandwidth constrained uh, environments such as Kenya. And it's going to be true for every wildlife uh, nature preserve out there pretty much to the, that's the engineering challenges, to the computer vision research that has to be done to build the system, the information integration, deployment of the system on the cloud, uh, visualization and the actual analytical engine to be able to ask the ecological questions from those data, to the aspects of citizen science and dealing with people who are involved in data collection and then engagement all the way through the whole process from data to insight and then education and outreach that we're really hoping will be one of the outcomes of this. So it's, it's simple things like people setting their time zone correctly for their cameras, right? So we have to be able to put a protocol in place where we can actually collect useful information. Tanya, tell us how you got motivated to work in this area. What, what was the motivation behind you going into computational ecology? My husband. He's an ecologist and we've been together for a long time. So it is through him uh, who, that uh, I first heard my first questions about ecology, my first stories, and my first job in ecology as a computer scientist. Uh, but it is through Moshe and his colleagues, uh, through these conversations, that I found myself both excited about these questions and quite often thinking, oh, there gotta be a better way of answering this question. And so finally, after many years, I decided to put my brain where my mouth has been and start finding a better way of answering these ecological questions. And uh, then going to Kenya with, through the collaboration with Dan Rubinstein uh, and being in that amazing setting, as a the researcher or as a, in, in the context of the course that Dan and I co-teach in field computational ecology and seeing students, not only ourselves, working on problems that neither of them or us would have been able to do by ourselves in our own respective fields and coming up with new ways of seeing the world, new ways of answering, understanding the natural world in this stunning setting of Kenya. I just find myself thinking something that few people get to say once in their lifetime. I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing and this is just luck and and, and, and the amazing opportunity that I continue to be grateful for and continue to be excited by. Well, I really want to thank you for being with us today, Tanya, and I really wish you very good luck out in Kenya and with your project in the future. It sounds like a great project that we're gonna have that will help everyone understand computational ecology better. Thank you, and thank you for all the collaborations. Sure. Fun peek back there to conversation between Tanya and Kristen. Uh, Kristen is here with me, and we were able to reach out and get in touch with Tanya. She is on the phone. She is in Kenya. We know it's very late, Tanya. In fact, it's almost tomorrow to you. Thanks for staying up very late with us. One question we would love to ask you about is uh, ultimately establishing that relationship with Microsoft. Talk about how you came to work with Microsoft. There are uh, about five places in the world, hello, by the way, there are about five places <laughs> in the world that have computational and ecology uh, together in their name, in the title, and Microsoft Computational Ecology Research Group at Cambridge UK is one of them. And so when I was looking for a place to spend my sabbatical, that group was a very natural place for me to be. Um, that started, I did spend three months there uh, in fall 2013, last fall, and it started wonderful collaborations, part of which is this project, Image-Based Ecological Information System, uh, started out of a collaboration also in discussions with the group there, with Lucas Jopa and with Drew Purves, and then I continued it because we, want, we realized that we need to uh, have it have it deployed on Azure on, on on the cloud, and so Azure was a choice, a natural choice for us. And in the spring, I came to work with Chris Toll and the Connections Group at Microsoft Redmond Research Redmond. 
Well, Tanya, we know it's very late there. Thanks for giving us a couple of minutes of your time. We want to let you get some sleep because we know you got zebras to track in the morning in just a couple of hours. Thanks for doing this with us. We appreciate it and keep up the great work, okay? Thank you. And thank you for, for, the, for the support. Absolutely. Great stuff there. And a big thanks to you, Kristen, as well for sure. leading the charge, doing the heavy lift. And you interviewed her. I just hit play. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> no I appreciate problem. Appreciate it.